Yo, listen up folks and brace yourselves. Today on the Adotat Show, we've got James Avery, the genius who turned Adzerk into Kevil and revolutionized retail media. This guy isn't just riding the retail media wave, he's the one making those waves. From partnering with the biggest names to redefining how we think about retail ads, James is the retail media mogul you need to hear from. Get ready to dive into the future of shopping and advertising. It's going to be a wild ride. Deserve to win when it matters most. Facing multi-billion dollar bet the company litigation? No problem. That's why we're here. Troutman Army LLP is a true legal power. You know, you've landed on the Adotage show where we slice through the ad tech jungle with the precision of a later laser-guided drone. I'm Pesach Latin, your chief instigator, poking the bear and stirring the pot. Today we snagged James Avery, the wizard behind Kevil, because apparently revolutionizing ad servers wasn't challenging enough for him. Strap in, folks, because this is going to be more fun than hacking your high school's computer system. So, James, congrats on raking another treasure chest in Kevl's Series C funding. It's not every day you'll find a golden doubloon in the startup seas. So how does it feel to be sailing with a heavier ship? Is it, a champ- is it champagne showers and caviar dreams? Or are you already eyeing the next monster wave? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, one, it's, it's great to, to get the round done. Anybody who's raised, uh, raised a round knows that it's just a, a slog, especially when you're raising this much money. Uh, but then also I think it's, you know, it's, it's not changing too much of who we are. We're definitely not doing champagne showers or, or, uh, being extravagant. Uh, you know, I think in this day and age, it's especially important to be very efficient and, and grow efficiently. So there's no right? Scrooge McDuck you know, diving into the no coins Scrooge right McDuck now. Diving, unfortunately, you know, still very focused on, you know, how do we, how do we spend this capital, uh, to really, you know, continue to build out the platform and, and sign more and more retailers. So the influx of gold in Kevl's coffers is bound to shift the winds. How are you planning to navigate the uncharted territories in this funding? Yeah, I mean, I think the one of the things I always tell people that's fun about my job is that it it changes every eighteen months, you know, as we scale and as we as we grow the company. And so this is just I'm I'm looking forward to another change and and kind of as we really start to scale out sales and marketing and and have more resources. I think you know my job's going to change, and you know everything everything at the company always changes, right? As you as you move towards the the next kind of uh, level of funding. What's healing the ad tech Everest in your morning coffee? How's the view from your vantage point? How are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I think, are you, how am I doing or how is Kevl doing? Yeah, how are you personally doing? How am I personally how are you doing? handling all uh, this? Yeah, I, I am doing great. Like, I've, I've been doing this for for 12 years now, which is a long time. Right. But I think I think what keeps me really excited is is that it is a new job every 18 months. Uh, and so there really is a kind of a new challenge. Uh, and I think too, that like where, where we are as a company is really exciting. So I'm, I'm kind of as excited as I was, you know, six months in, uh, maybe more so because we actually have paying customers now and, and we have uh, lots of traction. Uh, so it's, it's been fun. I can't wait to keep, keep doing it. So you were originally known as Adzerk. So the leap from Adzerk to Kevl wasn't just rebranded. It was like swapping a tricycle for a Harley. What sparked that high octane shift? Yeah, I mean, I think the the one reason was that ads are uh, a lot of people confused us for being an ad network, uh, and in a lot of ways we're right. like we're like an anti ad network. We're we're uh, you know we focus just on the technology. We don't you know harvest customers' data. Uh, we don't sell ads, and so we'd always have to have this initial conversation with ads are like you're a you're an ad network. You're a native ad network, and we'd have to like reframe right. it and say like oh no we're we're an ad server. We're focused on the technology. Uh, and then as we looked at retail media and started building more and more into our product, we realized that even just being called AdZerk, even if we we're going to say, oh, we're an ad server, like we're more than that, right? We've kind of announced our retail media cloud. And and so, you know, rebranding to Kevl gave us a chance to, you know, give us a nice name that's kind of symmetrical and doesn't have any baggage, right. you know? Right. Did you like go through the dictionary and like bevel, you know, we'll just add a K on it. Did anyone like, did everyone jump on board or were there like people like, here's my resume. We're not going to Kevl. You know, it was, uh, everybody jumped on board, but it was, we realized quickly that like when we decided we wanted to rename the company, uh, you know, everybody has their ideas, right. You know, from board members to investors to, you know, other people at the company, everybody had ideas. So we actually paid a company to come up with the name. So there's there's this uh, this company we we hired uh, and they'd also name things like Swiffer and the Power Book and so we didn't think we could afford them but apparently they like working with startups because they they cut us a deal uh, to help us come up with it but that way we'd have somebody else kind of say like hey this is this is the name you should use 
And actually, I didn't. How did you first? Kevels oh, are like an actual thing. So the like when really? you when you tie our kevels. Yeah, when you tie a boat right. to a dock, it's like that little like half shoe that you like tie the rope to. Uh, that is technically a kevel, but nobody knows that. So okay, is there any relevance or no? No, no relevance. Like, what, what was Adzerk? Was there actually a name? Was that also just anything? The yeah, Z was available. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, so I was like like berserk, like berserkers. Right. My my grandfather came over from Norway. And so I like the like berserker type thing, and so then we just slapped ad in front of it. Didn't think it would last ten years or however long it lasted. I was just you know domain name was available, seemed a little low effort, but but it worked for a while. How did you explain to investors uh, that you were changing the name? Was it smooth sailing, or was it a bit like convincing a cat to take a bath? No, they were they were actually relieved because I think they wanted us to change the name, but they were worried they were going to like <laughs> they hate saying ads or- yeah, they didn't want to call my baby ugly. You know, they're like, "Oh, James has worked on this for like ten years. Like, we can't tell him this name sucks." But you know, it was it was uh, once I said it, they were like, "Oh, great, thank you. Yes, let's do it." But, it sounds more professional. Yeah, I didn't I didn't actually realize it was the same company. Yeah, yeah, no, we get that sometimes. We'll have somebody who, uh, you know, comes in. Oh, I remember you at AdZerk. So what are you doing now? Well, it's just, yeah, it's the same yeah. company. It's just like same thing. It's AdZerk on steroids. Yeah, AdZerk with a lot more funding and a lot more tech. What was the first major win for Kevl that made you think, yeah, this is going to work? Uh, you, you, is it like a high five moment, or did it was it like everyone was like high fiving, or what was it like? Kind of for Kevl or back as like Adzerk in general, like like you just realized you were going to make it, like you could. This was actually a product people would want. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think our back in Adzerk, like back in this is 2010, uh, the first customer we ever signed was Stack Overflow. And so I right. actually had an opportunity to meet with like Joel Spolsky and Jeff Atwood. And, and I'd kind of known Jeff from some like engineering circles. And so they signed up to use us actually before we raised any money uh, when we were really, you know, it was just me. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, a you know, that was when I was like, okay, we actually, there's like a need in the market that this company, you know, pretty legit large publisher was saying, we don't want to use Google. We know there has to be something that that's a better fit for us. Uh, and they, you know, ended up picking this one person company at the time. Uh, and so then I was like, okay, well, to actually handle this, I'm going to have to hire people and raise money. Uh, but we, we right. did launch with them before, before even raising money. Like they were, they were launched before that initial seed round back in 2011. Is there anything you do different from the transition to Azure to Kevl? No, I mean, I think, I think right now I'd say one of the, I think we, we've done the right stuff. Sometimes it takes us longer than it should have. Uh, right. So I think like a lot of times, whether it's, uh, you know, we, you know, what was it two years, almost two years ago now, we acquired a company in the like first party data space. Uh, so a company was called Velocity uh, and we brought their CDP kind of retail media focused CDP into the product fold. Uh, I think that's something I wish I'd done sooner, whether it was acquiring them or was it was investing in our own CDP. Uh, but I think really kind of helping customers unlock first party data is something that we didn't do. We didn't do that early enough. It took us way too long to like, really dig in and help our customers do that when was the aha moment you're like i really want to get into retail media though like so it's 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 completely different it's a bit like launching a spaceship in your backyard yeah i mean the interesting thing is like i think a lot of our tech was basically our customers like customers came to us and said we want to use your tech to build retail media and we said sure that should work and they and they did. Did you even know what it worked. was at the time? Or? Yeah, I mean, like you know, we, we were familiar with it. And really, where we saw it first start off is in places like marketplaces. And so, really, like people like Cherish and and, and marketplaces, where they said we want to build our own, you know, ad platform. And they weren't even calling it retail media at the time. You know, so this is back in like 2017, 2018, like where you know there was like a little bit of retail media, but it was it was still basically Amazon and some Walmart. And so, you know, we, we saw it first in those kind of like those innovative marketplaces. And then now you have a lot of larger retailers that are all, you know, jumping on retail media. And so, you know, we, it took us probably, you know, just kind of in that 2018, 2019 timeframe where we're like, wait a minute, like this retail media wave, like looks like it's going to be legit. And then COVID like put it on steroids, right? Right. Um, how did you plan to stand out without stepping on any toes? Was it like a flamethrower to a knife fight or? It was like a charm offensive. No, I mean, I think that we, uh, you know, we compete with the kind of larger retail media players, but we've just taken a different approach. And so, you know, it is, it's not, uh, it's not a flamethrower. It's not like we would be the knife, I guess, in that scenario, if we tried to take them head on, but we just took the different approach right. of saying we're, we're technology, we're a, a cloud provider. 
We're not here to sell your ads. We're not here to harvest your data. And so you really have to kind of counter position against the incumbents. And so that's the approach we've taken is that we're going to, we're going to help you build it yourself versus we're going to run it for you and, and kind of pull in your data and, and do whatever we want. What was the, um, were people, uh, were, was it like wide amazement or were people like skeptical about doing this at first? Yeah. I mean, I think most customers, when we talk to them, even if we don't win the deal right now, they always say, this is where we want to end up. Right. right. And, the, and the skepticism sometimes is that, you know, a customer does have to do more work when they use us, right? Like they, maybe they have to build a sales org. Maybe they have to, you know, have some engineers that can build on our API and integrate with us. Uh, and so a lot of times customers, they might, they might see it and say, that is where we want to go, but we don't have the resources yet. And so we'll see those customers come back a year to a year later or two years later when their board says, you know, Hey, we really gotta, we gotta get more money from retail media. And they tell the board, yeah, you need to invest in it. And so then they get to hire that team and they get to, they get to move to us and build on top of our APIs. And so I think the approach is not, you know, it's not skepticism, but it's almost like, uh, like idealism. They're like, this is where we want to get to. We're like, can we, like, how long right. will it take us to get there? Is there a specific feature or like the secret sauce that you always present? Like, you know, the mic drop moment, everyone goes like, this is the product that makes Gevel amazing. Excuse me. My coffee. Yeah, I think that a lot of times it's funny. I think it's our, our API documentation. And so like when right. we're talking to a company and they're like, well, this is what we want to do and we want to be able to do this. And then we kind of walk through the flexibility of the APIs. You know, you see the engineers just their eyes light up and they start digging in and, and asking tons of questions. And, you know, I think none of our competitors really have the kind of full functionality or full, like fully featured APIs that we have and the flexibility. And so like we'll be in meetings sometimes where, you know, the customer, you know, will ask a question and one of their engineers will answer it. And they'll be like, oh yeah, no, right. this is just, this is just making a call to that API and passing in this value and then getting out that. And then we just do that server side. And we're like, yeah, that, they are correct. People like that flexibility. What, what, what is the flexibility? How does that help your clients? Yeah. So it really lets them build the ad platform that they, they really want to build. And so we kind of talk about, uh, you know, a lot of the other retail media platforms are kind of cookie cutter. They're out of the box. They're, they're optimized to get up and running quick and, and then sell, you know, sell their inventory in kind of a package to brands. Uh, what we see is that like these, the retailers that really want to generate large retail media, you know, revenue are looking to how do they differentiate themselves? What do they do that's unique to them? And so that's where the flexibility gives them the ability to, to be innovative and, and do something that's unique to their platform. You know, because I think the the competition in retail media networks is only growing, right? If you're if you're Procter and Gamble, like how many networks are out there trying to get you to spend on that, and how do you stand out? And so, really, our flexibility is what enables our customers to build to build networks that stand out, and hopefully, can get more of that you know share of Procter and Gamble's dollars. So, in the relentless wave of, of tech evolution, how do you keep paddling ahead without wiping out? Yeah, I think that's always the that's always the fun challenge, right? Like it's. It's how do you uh, how do you paddle out, catch we, the wave, and, uh, yeah. and not get not get rolled over by the wave, right? And I think it's just a matter of of picking the right clients and partners that are very collaborative. Because a lot of times we're you know we're working closely with customers on innovative things that they want to launch, uh, and so I think finding those those right partners that that you know where we work together to deliver that innovation, like that's what really helps us you know not get wiped out. Reflecting into your uh, journey to retail media, is there a retail media? Is there a specific battle scar that you're proud of? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm trying to think of one. Like a time where you did like 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. Yeah, I mean, I was saying uh, one of those. I can't, I can't name the customer. We were working with a large retailer, and they they launched and they they quickly scaled up the number of promoted listings and ads they were running into the millions. And, you know, when you're, when you're used to publishers, right? Like publishers right. might have a couple thousand, maybe 10, 20,000 ads running at any given time. They didn't have millions. And so that really pushed right. our system in a different way. Uh, and something that we had to basically scramble as an engineering team and both, you know, keep That's everything a lot of calls. running. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, yeah. it's million, millions of active ads, right? Because even the millions, like we get millions of, of requests all the time. It's like having the idea of like millions and millions of active ads. Uh, pushed our system in a different way. And we had a lot of engineers who were working late nights and, and over the weekends to keep the systems up and running and also improve the system so we could handle, you know, now we have customers with 10 million ads and it's not a problem. And so really that, I think that's probably one of the scars that people in like traditional ad tech don't think about in retail 
It's just the number of like live promoted listings and live ads that that happen in retail compared to kind of you know traditional banner and native that you're running. Uh, as Kevin charts its course through the retail media universe, what's the north star guiding your journey? Is it innovation, customer satisfaction, or conquering new frontiers? Yeah, I think our our really north star as a company is the customer revenue, how much our customers generate, and so we think that you know obviously we we folk we care about how much money we make. But I think like our kind of uh, our way of measuring how impactful we are for customers is how much are they generating? How much how much of that big retail media pie like goes through capital? Uh, and so that's right. that's what we look at as our kind of north star metric uh, internally. And how do we how do we help our customers grow? How do we sign customers who are going to build successful networks uh, and really focus on that? Do you think customers are surprised how much money is in it? Or you think they knew it when they were starting? I think they know now. I think early on they were surprised, but now that I mean, there's a press release every quarter with Amazon and how much they're they're making from retail media. So I don't I don't think they're surprised anymore. Uh, I think a lot of them are are also getting pushed by their board and and their you know directors to to really make more right because they all see what Amazon and, and Walmart are doing. Uh, so yeah, I think the the surprise is worn off, and now it's the the ambition that's taking over. What's been the biggest kraken you've had to face on the high seas of ad tech? The biggest what? Kraken, monster. Oh, kraken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's a good question. There's a lot of them, right? I mean, I think that that one that uh, you know, I guess we talked about this a little bit already is is just scale, right? I think one of the it's really fun things about ad tech, yeah, is just it's right. an ad tech. Like scale is at a different level, like billions of requests, millions of ads, uh, the amount of data that you're processing. So I'd I'd say scale is the the biggest thing that stops more people from from you know building things themselves. Right? And what, was that your biggest issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we've we've handled better now. Uh, but along the way, right? Like starting out as a small one person company, like scale has been, was probably one of the biggest things we had to attack. So how do you uh, cut through the fog and keep your message clear and compelling with uh, using all these buzzwords? Yeah, I mean, I'd say we're probably a little guilty of using buzzwords sometimes. Uh, I think everybody is. Retail media is a buzzword now. So retail media can't help it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that the key thing is like- Everything's retail media now. Everything's yeah. retail media. I think the key thing is knowing who we're talking to. Right. And a lot of times we're still we're still really talking to the people in the trenches that are responsible for building the retail media network. And so if you throw a bunch of just buzzwords at them and, you know, and and stuff that doesn't make any sense, then they're going to they're going to call bullshit pretty quick. Whereas, uh, you know, when you're when you're talking to them about, you know, verifiable results and capabilities, then that that rings true. So I think because of who we talk to a lot of times, I think it's, it's a lot easier to avoid the, you know, buzzword bingo. Is there a buzzword you use that you're embarrassed of, like synergy or paradigm shift? I don't think so. I think I'm I'm fairly buzzword light. <laughs> right. You let you let me know. We'll we'll see if at the end of this, if there's uh there's anywhere we need to like ding me along the way. Well, I always mention my favorite one is quantum, like quantum leaps. Because quantum means something that's really small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when yeah, so a quantum, quantum leap leaps is, is like it, it, it's like, <laughs> but that's just a small event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Step function. That's my favorite. That one gets said a lot. Sorry. Like people will talk about, yeah. oh, it's a step function change, you know, and you're like, okay. What does that even mean? Well, it's just like when you're, uh, it's more, I guess it's more programming based, but essentially like when, when you're looking at the, the change of a graph, right? It's not like a line, like a straight line. It's like going to go up like a, like a step. So your evolution has been impressive. Was there a moment when you realized you were no longer just another boat in the harbor, but a flagship? Uh, I mean, I think as, as we've kind of, you know, start to hear from customers and customers that reach out or prospects that reach out to us that are, you know, household names. I think that's when it really feels right. like, oh, you know, we're not, we're not the little, we're not the little guy anymore. Like people, people actually know who we are and, and, and come looking for us. Was it also the new business cards? Like you have the new logo out and you're like, oh, we're actually, a real company now. I don't even think I've gotten new business cards since we changed the name to Kevl. Like after COVID, like you didn't, you didn't print them for like two years no. and then, and then now I go to conferences and nobody has them anymore. So I don't even think I have new business cards. But I have you don't have like the hat. Do you have a hat or jacket though? We have to have like a, yeah, we have like the the vest, right? You have to have like the the San Francisco VC vest that says Kevl, so you can wear the uniform. The K. You get to San Francisco. Do you use a big K? People like think you like Kellogg's or something. Or no, we, we, tend to use, 
Yeah, the K we use, it's kind of a, it's actually a combination of the old Adzerk logo. Uh, some people don't know, it's like the two, the two chevrons kind of put together to be a K. Okay. And you, yep, no one gets confused though. Like you're like at a Kmart or something. Well, Kmart's not even around anymore. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if we could buy the name Kmart. We could have done that. Could have been. Yeah, you could be Kmart retail. <laughs> it wouldn't be confusing at all. Uh, looking at the next horizon, what's your next big adventure? Are there uncharted waters that you're itching to explore? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, the the big thing is we've been doing a lot of work with the IAB around uh, programmatic for open art for like basically right. open RTB for promoted listings. Uh, so I think that is really the next the next phase of retail media is is how do we bring it a little bit more into the programmatic ecosystem? Uh, so it's less kind of walled gardens and and you know we'll, we'll talk about like uh, you know drawbridged castles or something right but like some some sort of programmatic access into these different retail media walled gardens how would that work to I mean, obviously uh companies like walmart and amazon don't want to send their customers outside of amazon so how does that work yeah so fundamentally how it works is uh when you let's say you, let's just use amazon right if you're searching on amazon they have identified a certain number of of products that could be promoted right and like, let's say identifying what they're like asin number then essentially they would send their asin or upc uh in the open RTB request. And then when you bid on it, you would be bidding on that UPC or ASIN. You wouldn't be sending a creative, you wouldn't be sending your own URL. And so essentially it's, it's, you know, having a true promoted listing, but bought programmatically. And we think that that really open, what really that opens up is, you know, these large brands like Procter and Gamble, Unilever, people like that, who, you know, if they want to be able to say, I want to sell more diapers in this zip code, right? That right. they have to go to a hundred different retail media networks to do that, or can they go to you know the trade desk and say, "I want to you know promote more diapers and drive more sales in this zip code." And if it's on Instacart or if it's on Kroger's site right or Walmart site, like I don't really care as long as somebody's buying diapers. And so I think you know, that capability is something that you know we're, we're the spec is getting closer and closer. And then I think we're you know this year hoping to have like actual transactions running through it. Okay. As you continue your voyage, what's the legacy you hope to leave behind? Is it about the destination's reach, the battles won, or the way you change the course in your journey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really about how do we change how do we change the industry so that we don't go through some of the mistakes that we had in the rest of ad tech. I think retail media right. has this opportunity to to really keep a lot of power at the you know publisher retailer level. Uh, versus I think what we saw in ad tech was all the, a lot of the publishers just get devalued, right? Like they, you know, and we've seen a lot of them go bankrupt in the last couple of years. Uh, I think really that's how I look at my, my, our kind of mission is how do we, how do we really empower these retailers so that they don't go the way of, uh, you know, a lot of the publishers that we've seen. So from the pages of James Avery's origin story, what's the chapter titled where it all began? Again, give us the trailer version. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd say it all began with really me discovering the internet as a high schooler and starting to build websites. Right. And so I, I started the what company. Was your first website was for a company my dad was working for. It was like a PEO. For, it was I think it was like six pages of HTML. You know, didn't CSS didn't even exist back then, right? It was like table layouts and uh, and uh, right. just you know throwing images together. Uh, but I started that. You, was school. it? Do you just? Was it all hand coded, or do you have a good like what you see is what you get? GUI? No, no, it was all hand, all hand coded. Okay. Uh, back then, I think it was a tool I used called Home Site, which I think is long, long gone to the to the ages. But it was pretty much hand hand coded HTML, which isn't isn't really you know, isn't really coding, but it's close enough. Uh, but really, that's that's kind of where I got started in two things, which is one, like, you know, actual programming and developing, and two, and like starting my own company. And so, you know, I went, I went and worked for, you know, worked some normal jobs and stuff like that uh, after that. But, you know, I had started that company in high school and always loved the idea of like, how do I really, you know, start my own thing using what I know and, and go out there and, and make something of it. Behind every great man is fill in the blank. Who is the Yoda to your Luke Skywalker in this galaxy of ad tech? Uh, I mean, I think like, first and foremost, it's my wife. Like when she, uh, I met my wife when I was 20 uh, and she's always been super right. supportive of, of what I'm doing and pushing me to do more than, than what I always thought I could do. So I don't know if that's technically, I don't know if she wants to be called Yoda, uh, but I think that she's, uh, yeah, she's she always might be offended. <laughs> Get me in trouble here. You remind me of a, <laughs> a little old 2000 year old creature. Yeah, but, but I think she would appreciate the, the sentiment of that really. Yeah. I mean, like even when, like, you know, as I, 
went out to start Kevl uh, and Adzerk at the time, uh, you know, she was always like, yeah, you can totally do this. Like, you should go do it. And, you know, even though there was obvious uh, financial risk for both of us in doing it. Is there like a portrait you find yourself drawn to time to time in the gallery of greats? Like someone actually in the industry that you'd hang behind you? I mean, I think one of my early one of my early mentors uh, has been a guy named Brian Hanley. So he was actually the okay. he was behind Exhibitor. I think like the separate the second batch of Exhibitor, and then it got you know bought by Microsoft as part of that big like a quantum deal. Uh, but he is a he's based uh, in Raleigh, like I am, and he was one of our first angel investors. And I remember when when I was raising one of my initial rounds, he kind of came around with me. It's kind of like the the dad taking his son around to like to raise money. Maybe not. He might not want to be referred to that way either. But he was a great like early mentor in the industry of like, hey, who here's who these guys are. Here's how this works. Here's why Google can do this and nobody else can. And here's how you know he he really helped educate me a lot in that tech uh, because I was kind of coming in as an outsider uh, back then. Uh, building company culture isn't just about bean bags and free snacks. It's curating an art gallery. Where every piece contributes to the whole. What's your philosophy behind creating the Kevl culture? Was it a Bob Ross happy little accidents approach, or did you have a blueprint more complex than IKEA instructions? Yeah, I think it's uh, early on. We've had like there's kind of been one big value that I think people associate the most with Kevl, and that early on was a big intentional thing of mine, which was that we're all adults, and just right. I think I stole it from stole it from Netflix, right? But just the idea of of look like we're all adults here like don't don't ask for permission to go to a doctor's appointment like put it on your calendar and go to the doctor like don't don't try to you know micromanage when somebody works or when they log into their zoom or when they're when they're available right like we're here to get a job done and get your job done and and you know when you have to leave you have to leave and back when we went into the office i always made an example of that where i would leave at 3 30 every day to go get my kids from the bus right. stop and then i get back on after dinner and work, you know, two or three hours and, and crank out a bunch of emails. And so I think that that's always been, I think, the biggest cultural, like, cornerstone of Kevl is that, you know, we're all adults and we're not here to, you know, micromanage people and, and uh, you know, we have, to, we have to trust each other as adults. And if somebody shows they're not an adult or not capable of being an adult, that doesn't mean make more rules. That means that person's not a fit for the company. Are you, are you, when setting the culture, are you more like a benevolent dictator or a democratic president? I guess probably more benevolent dictator because I don't think they can vote me out. Right? Would they? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they. I hopefully they wouldn't. I don't think they would. But uh, but I th I think that you know we we also focus a lot. I think on I'm, I guess in the same vein as we're all adults is really like autonomy and like how do how do you right. give people more autonomy in their job? And so I think the uh, you know there's definitely more benevolence there. But but every once in a while you have to be a dictator. Right? In the realm of tech, where work balance often tips how do you keep the scales even is it a type rope walk or have you found the secret garden of equilibrium yeah i think it's i think it ties back to that everybody being an adult and knowing what they're right. capable of and what they can do and so like there's times right. where i know people work 70 hour weeks and then there's times where you know i encourage everybody to take take two weeks off in one go right to take vacation to take time off i do it right i try to lead by example there and so I think there really is that, you know, and then there's weeks that are going to be easier and weeks that are going to be way harder. Uh, but we, we kind of trust people as adults to, to be able to know what they're, you know, what they can do without burning themselves out, without, without overworking themselves. I, I don't is there any secret like Kevl yoga pose or anything? No, I don't, I don't think there's any secret. And I'm sure there are cases where, you know, that people have gotten to the point where they're, you know, they don't know that limit and they need somebody to help them understand like, hey, go take two weeks off, right? Go, go, go. You got to leave. Yeah, you I know no, those conversations have happened. And so sometimes a manager has to help somebody out with that. But but yeah, I think it's it's all about that finding that balance. What do you think of like group building stuff? Do you like the games and things? Are you kinda of, are you keep those things out of Kevl? I'm uh I'm notorious for, for hating cooperative games. Like when we talk about like oh, me too. games and things like that. Like when people are like, let's do a cooperative like game. all like any sort of like corporate trust stuff. I hate those. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I don't like that stuff either. Like team, uh, team building. Like you, you, I hate team building in core. Film. Yeah, for me, like, team again, building. I feel like I feel like we're adults again. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think team building we, to me we, is we, like we don't need cheerleaders, right? Right. Yeah. To me, team building is just having time to to hang out with people that's not necessarily on like a Zoom call. You know, like when we when we travel somewhere, you know, I, this is one of my favorite things about going to visit our team in London, right? It's like the the thing in London right. is five o'clock, five thirty. Everybody goes to the pub and you have a pint, 
Right. You're not doing a trust fall or like have some coordinator, like, you know, having you all like tell two truths and a lie, but you're having a couple of pints at a, at a pub with every that you worked with. And you're talking about customers. You're talking about your kids. You're talking about, you know, whatever. Uh, I think it is important to kind of build a team in that way sometimes, uh, or like go and, you know, do events. Like, we'll you know, go, go out and golf with people or go, go to a, go to a, like you do an offsite and you go to a, you know, Rockies game or something like that. Uh, so there's lots of, you know, I think things like that can be good, but yeah, I'm not a fan of the, like, I call it like manufactured fun or forced fun. You know, some people, oh, yeah, my, my wife uh, works for public schools and she hates it. She, she brings her uh, Kindle and sits through them, she says, and sends me messages like making fun of the stuff. Like she'll yeah, send me like yeah. pictures of people on stage dressed ridiculously. And she'll say, now we have to watch this guy dress like toast for some reason. I have no idea what he's doing. But yeah, I feel we, you there. We um, used to, when we had so, the, uh, yeah. when we had the office, when everybody was in the same office, we would play a lot of board games, but that was where, that was where I, that was where I first went with the hating cooperative board games. Cause I'm like, this is what we do all day. We sit around and debate right. what the right way to win is like what I want to do. If we're going to play a game, I want to be ruthless. You know, I want it to be, I win, you lose. That's it. Right. Cause it's the opposite of what we do during the day. And so uh, we used to do a lot of that, which I think was another fun, like team building that wasn't, wasn't forced fun, right? It was like, you're playing a fun board game and competing against your coworkers. Right. You ever play Catan? Yeah. Yeah. We, we played Catan. We played a lot of those like power grid, Catan, like uh, guillotine, lots of stuff. So speaking of innovation, um, how do you foster cultural creativity? Is it like Willy Wonka factory of ideas or Edison lab? Yeah. I mean, I think to start with, it was more Edison lab. But I think one of the things I'm proud of is that as we've, as we've grown and as like more people in the organization have kind of taken on product leadership roles and technical leadership roles, right. that it's, it's a little more like Willy Wonka and there's, there's cool stuff going on that I'm not involved with at all. And so I think that's been who like the company has the golden ticket. Who in your company has the golden ticket? There's, there's a handful of guys that, that, uh, and gals that I think have the golden tickets when it comes to, uh, like pushing the product forward. So you mentioned remote work. It's the new norm for a lot of people. How did you adapt to its culture? To f- How did you adapt your culture to fit this model? Yeah, I think we were a little lucky in that right before 2020, we had started a little bit of remote work, like on the engineering right. side. The guy, Tim, our uh, CTO, he he lives in New Hampshire. I live in Raleigh. He was one of our like initial remote hires. Uh, actually, a guy, Craig, uh, was our first remote hire. was another engineer. Uh, so we had started to hire kind of remote uh, before 2020. And then once 2020 hit, it was like, well, at least we'd figured things out. Like we had a Zoom account and we knew how to use Zoom. And we, you know, we, we had the basics of how to hire people in other states and things like that down. So then we got a little bit of a lead. But now, now we're, you know, fully remote, you know, multiple continents, you know, really have embraced it. And I, I can't imagine really going back. I miss the, I miss the in-person piece, but I think the right. ability to hire like the best person for the job, you know, across, you know, three continents, like you can't, you know, you can't really trade that. Do you have like a weekly Zoom happy hour or anything? Uh, we do some of that. We do like like happy hours or uh, different kind of contests, things like that. Anything that works that you want to share? I mean, I think the thing I love the most is uh, Donut. I don't know if you've heard of Donut. It's like a Slack Slack company, I guess. They're like a plug-in right. Slack, and it, it randomly pairs people up to just have like a 15-minute like coffee with them. So, uh, you know, I've probably In the done company or randomly things. across Slack? Oh, in the company. In the company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're not... Uh, <laughs> No, not just like random other people on Slack. Yeah, no, like, and, and so it's great. Like when a new person starts, they can, they can like, like join Donut and then they'll probably end up having a call with me and like a bunch of other people that have been there a long time and then other new people. And, and it's kind of a fun, like recreation of the, you know, lunchroom or water cooler, right? You know, remote. So looking into the crystal bottle, where does James Avery see himself when the pages of the calendar? keep turning five years from now are we taking talking empire expansion or a peaceful retreat i think i think we can keep like right now it looks like there's no end to how much we can expand and i think the you know if that changes then maybe my view would change but right now it just seems like there's so much opportunity in retail that i think even five years from now we'll still be still be building the empire if if you you had like a hundred million dollars is there like anyone you want to buy uh, I think there's a lot of interesting companies out there, uh, but I, I shouldn't say any of their names. Uh, but I think there are, when we when we look at like what it takes to build a retail media network, I think there's other companies that are part of that puzzle that at some point we, right. we, could, we could end up acquiring. 
like maybe a TV company or something or technology or like, where do you think it's going to, the next, is everyone going to go the Vizio Walmart way or what? Yeah. The Vizio Walmart one's interesting. Like I, I don't think it would make sense for us to buy a TV company, but I think right. what I think about is like, if one of our customers goes and does that, right? Like how would we support them in that? How would we help them? You know, how would we help power some of the, you know, CTV we're doing a lot or investigating a lot into like in-store. And so like, there's a lot of opportunity at in-store uh, that today, like a lot of these in-store displays are pretty, pretty dumb, right? Like they might rotate a couple of images and, and how does that really move to the next level? Like, how do you get much better in-store retail media? So I think there's a lot of opportunities there too. On the actual TVs that are like sitting in Walmart or something that are on? Yeah. Or even just like about? the, you know, like the, the screens that you have in the grocery store. Uh, one of the fascinating things, like if you go, if you go to a grocery store in Europe, they have a lot more screens in the store compared to here in right. the US. And so I think we're going to see the same thing happen here. So even like the, you know, the aisle marker, right? That tells you, oh, this is cereal and peanut butter. Like, why is that not digital? Why isn't GIF sponsoring where it well, says... Well, Amazon peanut- had tried to use their um, paperwhite technology for that never caught on. I don't know if you remember when they introduced the Kindle, they had pointed out that the paperwhite could be used for the signs. And, you, you know, yeah, since yeah. it's only a, it's, it's a static charge, you don't have to keep the electricity running at it. But I don't, that never caught on though. Yeah, I don't think it, and I think for a lot of the a lot of the big grocery chains and other big box stores, like they've been hesitant to to put a lot of screens, but I think it's starting to change. Uh, well, like cooler for, screens, like cooler screens was like also like kind of didn't help the cause, right? Because people would like see the picture on the cooler screen, open the cooler, and then the cooler was empty. Like that's not the experience right. we want. <laughs> no, I think hopefully what the ads, that, but yeah, yeah. Just want, want the ads and the promotions to, you know, to see that we'll give you an extra dollar off this monster if you buy it and things like that. But, but I think they're still, I think, translucent. Who was it? Like Samsung, maybe, that came out with, like, the translucent LCDs uh, right. at the last CES. Like, I think that has a lot of potential, right? Because then you're not, you're not hiding what's in the cooler. You're, you're doing an overlay, right? Like a unique overlay. So I think you could, you could yeah, see yeah, it like come Like a HUD, right? Like a heads-up yeah. display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. So before we go, probably, I think I've asked you before, but I'll ask you again. If you could send yourself a time traveling text message to yourself in the past, what would you tell yourself? Yeah, I think uh, you know, obviously not the you know buy Apple or whatever, but uh, you know, I, w- I would say I would say don't don't worry about failure. And I think that's what right. I always try to tell young people is it's like I think you know culturally we like to you know point out when other people fail and we have a lot of people that are scared of failing and i think what i tell my young self is like don't worry about it like everybody fails you're gonna fail a ton even if you become successful so i what think what was that's your best the, failure uh, i mean i started a number of companies before ad Zerk, you know and ones that failed because there wasn't a good like you know wasn't a good market there's ones I, that failed because we uh you know i don't think had the the right team working on it. Uh, and so, you know, all of those failures, I look back on them now and to say that is great lessons to learn, right? And maybe it was painful at the time, but I don't look back on it with pain. And that's a wrap on today's electrifying episode of the Attitat Show with the one and only James Avery. A big thanks to James for sharing his journey from Adzerk to Kevil, navigating Series C funding and revolutionizing ad tech like a true pioneer. His insights into retail media and scaling heights in the industry are pure gold. We couldn't do this without our fantastic sponsor, Troutman Amin LLP, the legal eagles specializing in TCPA and compliance. Your support keeps our ship sailing smoothly through the digital seas. Remember, in this fast-paced world of advertising, standing still is not an option. This is Pesach Latin, signing off. Tune in next time for another dose of mind-blowing insights and irreverent banner. And remember what we always advise? Stay curious, stay bold, and know more than you did yesterday.